Good morning. Good morning. I'm Chaplain Kevin G. White coming to you from Fort Beach. And uh, I did get to fill in here once before uh, when we were totally virtual. So this is way better. Amen. <laughs> it's really great to have uh, people to preach to. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I've been at Fort Meade for a couple years. I'm um, actually, like, just like y'all are in a time of transition, I am also. I'll be uh, heading to Fort Bragg in July, uh, but I'll be, I'll be here for the next three Sundays. I'm very thankful for the opportunity uh, to, uh, to worship with United Methodist brothers and sisters, so uh, thank you for having me. And, uh, Sure, there's other announcements I'm supposed to share, but uh, they're, in the they're in the bulletin, so <laughs> y'all have that. So I invite you to stand uh, for our call of worship, and uh, it's uh, from Psalm 92, verses 1 through 4. I'll read the regular print, and you respond with the bold print. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High. To declare your steadfast love in the morning, and your faithfulness by night. To the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me God by your work. At the works of your hands, I sing to you. Amen. Let's pray. God of every thought and reality, the holy, prophetic, sustainer of community, we gather here today as your people. Children of the good news, assure us of your presence once again that we may trust the mystery of life and growth as we gather in the name of our Savior, who is Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing the first two verses of hymn number 388, O Come and Dwell in Me. of Christ be with you all. All right, now as brothers and sisters in Christ, confident that not only does God hear us when we pray, that he answers the what uh, joys or concerns would you like to share this morning? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I have a request. 
can't hear you. I have a joy to see all these wonderful people here that we've seen for a long time. Amen. Thank you, Lord. All right, uh, we do have a prayer list. It's on the back of your bulletin. If you want to put someone on the prayer chain, you can email the office or Cindy Sar at the uh, email there on the bulletin. Okay, let's go to God in prayer. Go ahead. Yes, amen. Yeah, we pray that you will experience that peace that surpasses all understanding and comes only from God in Jesus. Holy God, we do thank you for this opportunity today to gather in person. Uh, thank you for all that has transpired to make that possible. We thank you even more, Lord, that uh, we confidently are aware of your presence because Jesus promised that where two or more are gathered in his name, he's with us. He's in our midst. So welcome, Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to that fact. That we are gathered in and with Jesus this day. Almighty God, all those prayer concerns that were voiced this morning, those on our prayer chain list, and those that were kept silent, but voiced in the, in the deepest parts of our hearts. We, we lift them up to you. And we thank you that you hear us and you answer us according to your will. I pray, Lord God, that you would continue to bless Trinity United Methodist Church, those of us that were able to gather here in person, those who are gathering with us virtually, and those who have yet to return but will soon. Uh, we thank you for the ministry of our outgoing pastor, and we pray your blessings on the incoming pastor. We ask all these things in the mighty name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Our scripture for this morning comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 17. Some people used to like to read along. The Bibles are here. So if you would like to, that's <clears throat> That's our um, reference for today. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we are always confident, even though we know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we do have confidence. And we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For all of us must appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each may receive recompense for what has been done in the body, whether good or evil. <clears throat> Therefore, Knowing the fear of the Lord, we try to persuade others, but we ourselves are well known to God. And I hope that we are also well known to your consciences. We are not recommending ourselves to you again, but giving you an opportunity to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast in outward appearance and not in the heart. For the love of Christ urges us on, because we are convinced that one has died for all. Therefore, 
all have died. And he died for all, so that those who live might live no longer for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for them. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Oh Lord God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts would be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So what do uh, Prince Harry, Elon Musk, T.S. Eliot, Matthew McConaughey, Ashley Judd, Emma Watson, and Hugh Jackman all have in common? They're not all from Texas. No. <laughs> they all took a, gear, a, a gap year off or a year off to study abroad. That's what they have in common. It's, it's now about mid-June and high school or seniors got their diplomas within the past three weeks, including this past Monday, my son Ezekiel uh, graduated from Meade High School. And uh, many of these seniors, they, they go on gap years. There's even an organization the Gap Year Association to help students uh, who want to take a gap year. The association emphasizes that a gap year is a year on rather than a year off because they want to combat the notion that students are just taking a year-long vacation from school. Rather, students who take time away between high school and college design their year with specific goals in mind. Me personally, I took a, a, a two-year gap called enlisting in the Navy. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> it was definitely the right choice for me. I wasn't really ready to start college. And uh, when I, after two years of uh, scrubbing toilets, bucking floors, and shining brass, I was more than ready <laughs> to go to college. Uh, students who take a, get, a gap year use the time to gain professional skills, to volunteer for an important cause, or, or travel the world, just to name a few popular gap year activities. This is, this is a critical insight for our discussion of today's reading from 2 Corinthians 5. During a gap year, students are living in the meantime, that is, between the end of high school and the beginning of college. It can, it can be an, an important time. It can be valuable time, or it can be time frittered away. Even in ordinary pre-COVID times, Harvard University made a practice of encouraging its uh, admitted students to consider deferring admission and taking a gap year. 20% of its first year students have now taken them up on that offer, roughly three times the number that usually defer. Many, if not most, of these students use the year to travel and experience personal growth and prepare for their future. Like uh, one young lady I, I read about, Annabelle. Annabelle, after high school, found herself, uh, she found herself in kind of what she called a, a, a train wreck of a life. She was under pressure from family and friends uh, and teachers to get right to college, right to university life. But, but Annabelle felt she needed some time to become the best version of herself. So Annabelle took a gap year. Writing on Medium.com, she says that she became a runway model for the Quintus Art Gala. Uh, she says, I was able to take singing lessons, play in my alumni and town's band, produce the high school's musical, and even act in a play. I didn't have much time aside from work and all this, but in that extra time, I painted and did uh, makeup artistry. Some people bought my art or paid me to do their faces. If that weren't enough, 
I went from just your average cashier to head of the entire cosmetics section at Target. And the following year, she enrolled in the theater program of a nearby university. And today she works at the same university as a staff carpenter. Annabelle's story is not unusual. One high school counselor said that she knew of a student who had gone to Thailand to work on an elephant preserve. She knew of another who worked for a rugby team in Australia and another who went to Denmark and lived with a host family. He returned to the United States and attended Crichton University. In a sense, gap year kids are living in the meantime. They're living between the past and their future. They're in a twilight zone that they know will not last forever, which is fortunate because like the twilight zone, some weird stuff often happens. And sometimes the weird stuff is what others simply call growing up, but still, it, growing up is weird. Uh, the Apostle Paul has an interesting take on this thing we call life. For him, his whole life, from his, his encounter with Jesus until his earthly demise, that whole period of his life was a gap life. It, it was a life in parentheses. A life in the anteroom of the kingdom of heaven. It was life before life. He, he wrote, while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. We would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. Paul is living in the meantime. What does meantime mean? Meantime is a period of time between now and then. It's a liminal Time, which means relating to a transitional or initial stage of a process. It's a, a threshold. Here's a, here's a real-world example of liminal time, of, of in the meantime. You're at the airport early. You've checked in, paid all the extra fees, cleared security, and now you're putting your jacket and shoes back on. This is the now part. Your flight doesn't leave for another 90 minutes. That's the then part. So between the now and the then, you decide to get a bite to eat at a little cafe and check your email. Perhaps you have a little work to do. You might read a book. You're living in the meantime. Paul was too. Now his flight wasn't scheduled to leave quite yet. In fact, he didn't know when he would be pushing back from the gate. In another letter, the one he wrote to the Philippians, he says that he's packed and ready. But as he says in Philippians 1, 21 to 26, he suspects there will be a delay. For to me, living is Christ and dying is gain. If I'm to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. And I do not know which I prefer. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ for that is far better, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. Since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that I may share abundantly in your boasting in Christ Jesus when I come to you again. Notice Paul's comment about being pressed between the two. He knew that he was living in the now, even though he preferred the then. For him, it, it was a choice, not his to make, of course, but it was a choice between life or death. For us, living in the meantime does not involve this choice, one would hope. Often, however, when we're living in the meantime, we, we feel like we're on a treadmill, or perhaps we have a sense in the pit of our stomach, or, or in some profound place in our heart that we're marooned on a sea of uncertainty. We're stuck. The winds aren't blowing. We're going nowhere. Or at least that's how it feels. The Apostle Paul didn't feel that way. In prison, he was doing time, but it wasn't a bad time. And even when he wasn't in prison, life was no bed of roses. He was beaten, abused, shipwrecked, and, and more. Living in the meantime for him meant living in some mean times. But he did not regard his gap life to be an empty life. Quite the contrary. Uh, Paul thought of downtime as uptime with the Lord. And to go back to that crucial insight mentioned at the top of my sermon, that 
is that a gap year is not a year off, but a year on. Every year of Paul's Christian life was a year on for the Apostle Paul. And it can be for us. No doubt there are some high school students who will fritter away a gap year, using it as an excuse to be lazy. Most, however, have a plan. The Apostle Paul did. He was quite clear about his, the mission of his gap life or of his living in the meantime. In the meantime, while awaiting his death or the return of Christ, whichever came first, he definitely had work to do. And there were people who needed him to fulfill his mission because a disciple's residence, whether earthly or heavenly, is irrelevant since a greater objective is under consideration. Namely, pleasing God. This goal is the believer's primary task. Pleasing God is our purpose. Since all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each may receive recompense for what has been done in the body, whether good or evil. So we are called to please God, and we all have a specific calling or purpose within that general call. To learn more about Paul's sense of purpose, we need to move beyond today's lectionary reading to verses 18 to 21. There we learn that Paul sees his mission as that of an ambassador working in the area of reconciliation. He entreats his readers, according to verse 20. He explicitly calls himself an ambassador for Christ, and his message is reconciliation. His mission while living in the meantime is to urge people to be reconciled to God. Obviously, he believes that people hadn't quite caught the core message of the gospel. They were unaware that God doesn't have an issue with them. We've been reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. This is the good news, y'all. This is the good news. Paul's mission is to tell him, hey, God has no beef with you. Why not be reconciled? Reach out. God is ready to receive you as one of God's own children. God's free gift of salvation by grace through faith is available to all. There is nothing left to do to be saved. Jesus has done it all. He said so himself. It is finished. So Paul works as an ambassador for the kingdom of God in the meantime. His work is to get people to turn their faces to God and have a fresh start. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. Being an apostle was Paul's mission. It might not be yours. But you're, when you're living in the meantime, when you're going through an interlude because of sickness, a layoff, a global pandemic, an economic downturn, or a failed relationship, just what is your mission? We can't possibly think that God's plan, God's will, or God's purpose for us is aimlessness, confusion, and despair. Can we? I hope not, because it's not true. The co-founder of Pixar, Edwin Catmull, once said, There is a sweet spot between the known and the unknown where originality happens. The key is to be able to linger there without panicking. That's the meantime. Ed Catmull and the Apostle Paul are assuring us that this life between Christ's first appearance on earth and Christ's imminent return is a liminal Time. We are in the threshold of glory. We are living in the meantime of God's glorious, already not yet kingdom. There must be a secret to successful living in the meantime when we're caught between parentheses, when we're in this no man's land, when we're in a spiritual demilitarized zone, right? Yes, absolutely. And Paul mentions it in our reading for today. It's, it's right there in the beginning of the passage that was read. It's, it's easy to miss, but it's there. 
The Bible's advice about successfully living in the meantime was a major thing for the Apostle Paul. It was a tune that he played continually, and it dominates his writings. In our text today, he reveals the mystery in verses 6 and 7. So we are always confident. So we are always confident. Why? Why are we always confident? For we walk by faith, not by sight. For the Apostle Paul, it is always about faith. He isn't saying we should fake it till we make it. Rather, he simply urges us to recall our core values and begin to live by them. He's convinced that when we do this, our purpose and mission will reveal itself. For an illustration of this, let's turn from, from faith to football. I'm from Texas. I need to talk about football periodically or I deflate. <laughs> football. And I want to talk about football's greatest ever ambassador and apostle. The person for whom the Super Bowl trophy is named, the great coach Vince Lombardi. In his best-selling biography of Lombardi, David Marinus pinpoints the moment the Green Bay Packers began their march to greatness. It began the summer of 1961. The Packers had lost the 1960 championship game against the Philadelphia Eagles when they squandered a fourth-quarter lead. Lombardi opened camp. He knew the players were the players were, were they were brooding about the loss. They wanted to sharpen their skills. They wanted to take their game to the next level. They were living in the meantime, that time between their humiliating defeat and the moment still in the future when they would hoist the trophy. They were so close. They were so close they could taste it. They felt it. To a man, everyone believed this except Lombardi. When the players came into camp that summer, he regarded each of them as a tabula rasa, a blank slate. He was going to start over with these kids. Marinus writes, he took nothing for granted. He began a tradition of starting from scratch, assuming that the players were blank slates who carried over no knowledge from the year before. He began with the most elemental statement of all. Gentlemen, he said, holding the football. This is a football. That's, you got to get right back to the, to the core. He took the team back to the fundamentals. He taught them how to block and tackle. And under Lombardi's tutelage, they never lost another playoff game. They beat the New York Giants 37-0 to that year, and they won five championships in seven years and three in a row during one stretch. And he never coached a team with a losing record. Fundamentals first, said Coach Lombardi. Faith first, says the Apostle Paul, because faith is the fundamental secret. Paul holds up faith like Lombardi held up a football. Friends in Christ, this is faith. Walk by it. Hold it. Don't drop it. Don't let it slip from your grasp. Cling tightly to it. Defend it from all attacks. Believe in it. Carry it, and it will carry you to victory. This is faith. It's the core of living successfully in the meantime. Most high school students who, who take a gap year do so voluntarily, but life doesn't always work that way, does it? Sometimes we, we have no choice. A gap life is thrust upon us. Something happens and suddenly we are living between two points, what was and what we hope will be. Meanwhile, we've got to figure this out. Speaking of living in the meantime, Father Richard Rohr in his book, Wondrous Encounters, he says, Lyman is the Latin word for threshold. A liminal space is the crucial in-between time when everything actually happens and yet nothing appears to be happening. It is the waiting period when the cake bakes, the moment the movement is made. The transformation takes place. One cannot just jump from Friday to Sunday. In this case, there must be a Saturday. This, of course, was always the holy day for the Jewish tradition. The Sabbath rest was the pivotal day for the Jews. And even the dead body of Jesus rests on Saturday, waiting for God to do whatever God plans to do. 
It is our great act of trust and surrender both together. A new creatio ex nihilo, a new creation out of nothing is about to happen, but first it must be desired. With faith, our living in the meantime will be successful, and, and our living in the meantime will be life-giving. We can join in God's ministry of reconciliation. None of us is just an ordinary human living on earth. Each person is measured not by what is seen or outward appearance, but by what is not seen, by what God is doing. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. There is no one else quite like you. And God loves you. God loves each and every one of us, and God will never leave us nor forsake us. We can survive living in the meantime. We can thrive in liminal times because the experience of being truly loved is transformative. In 2 Corinthians 5, Paul writes as someone who has experienced the unsurpassable love of Christ that transformed him from a persecutor of the church into a servant of the gospel. When he, Paul, confidently declares in verse 17 that if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. He is speaking out of his own experience into the lives of the Corinthian believers. Christ's love is ultimate. It brings people into trusting relationship with God and each other and empowers us to live out that same love which seeks the good and growth of all. This love compels Paul and his co-workers to continue their ministry of reconciliation amidst ongoing persecution, suffering, and threat of death. They keep going. Love is the ultimate power in the universe. God is love. Paul walked by faith, and so can we. Paul was an ambassador for Jesus Christ, and his mission was to reconcile people to God. The fundamental truth to which we must cling is that God loves us and has a purpose for us, and God is working out that purpose right now, one day at a time. We're living in the meantime, and it's a great time to be alive. Amen. Let's uh, stand and finish the hymn we started, hymn number 388, O Come and Dwell in Thee, and let that be our prayer. Please be seated. And now uh, the, the ushers are going to pass the plate.
as we uh, we have an opportunity to worship God through giving. Uh, well, let's pray. Lord of all bounty and bless and blessing, the gifts we offer you are like seeds. Some will take root nearby, and we will see them grow and bear fruit. Some will be carried far beyond where we can see, and we have faith that they will find good soil and thrive. We thank you for the privilege of being called to sow. Bless with the joy of good fruit, the seed we will see and the seed we will never see. We pray this in the loving name of Jesus, gardener and savior, amen. stand and receive these words of blessing. As the Father has loved you, go now and love. As the Son has forgiven and redeemed you, go now extending grace to all you meet. As the Spirit has transformed you into the likeness of the Son, go now letting the life of Christ guide you each moment of the day. Go now in love with grace and in the light of Jesus. Amen. Amen.